back to this. Sorry about that, folks. I don't, it, well, actually, you know, my submarine training comes in handy here because it's, uh, it's you learn not to panic when things go off the uh, deep the deep end and you, you put on your gear and just keep going at it. So let's let's go ahead and get, get into the story here. So most people, and, and uh, Ron is very good, it, 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 the proper pronunciation is fungi. So most people introduce me as the fun guy. So I, that's why I put this slide in here to, uh, to affirm that it's really fungi and people can use different things. But the most important thing about it is what is a fungus? Most people don't really realize what that is. So the four underlying terms are, the, and this is the official dictionary definition. I'm gonna talk to each of those. So you don't need to look, look at that. So first of all, here they are defined. Eukaryotic is having a nucleus, you probably know that. Heterotrophic means that it makes does not make its own food like plants do. Absorptive is the one that's with a star. That's the most important, the most unique uh, of fungus. And of, of these, it's the only unique thing. And the last one is it reproduces by spores. So those are the four rules to be a fungus. So each of, uh, a slide for each of those, and you probably, most of this is very much repetitive to you, but it was not to me when I first started digging into this in the, about 2000 or so. Um, when I when I bought with biology, it was all animals and plants, and everything else was you know, and fungi were part of the phylum uh, Thalophyta. So this is what the world looks like, and you can see that fungi are uh, a kingdom, just like everything else. And and you also notice how things have been moved around. They, they probably even have moved this beyond that. But the bottom the bumper sticker there is what I like to keep people uh, focused on. The world as we know it, and you now probably. Have, followed some of this stuff, which I'll talk about how connected it really is. Plants produce, animals consume, and fungi produce. So, so the fungi are a kingdom, uh, just like anything else. And this is just the basic breakdown, like every other kingdom. They got violent class order, family, genus, and species. And you're familiar with this being italicized, and here is a typical form. These are the phyla of fungi. So most of what we'll talk about tonight will be in this mycelium mycota. Most of our mushrooms are in that form. So heterotrophic means more to a fungus than it does to most things, like us, although we are omnivores. Uh, there are three ways that fun mushrooms eat, if you will. They're saprophytic, which is dead things, parasitic, which is live things, and then mycorrhiza, which is a shared thing. Uh, it means literally fungus root. And I'll show you some more slides on that because that's really the most important part of what I want to take away from here with regard to what why fungi are important. So this is the, the fourth, if you will, the absorptive part or third. Uh, they are, fungi are the only real of the few bacteria that can break down, they're enzyme, masters of the enzyme, if you will, and they can break down cellulose and lignin. Uh, the graph shows you uh, out of uh, about 500 grams of soil, 454 of it is, is fungi other than plant matter. So most of what's going on is breaking down the cellulose. So this is what you see in the woods quite frequently. It's called brown rock. That's when all the cellulose is gone. You've seen that, I'm sure. And this is a vitally important function, uh, this decomposition. Uh, and if it weren't for the fungi breaking things down, we'd be, we'd be burying tree trunks, among other things, uh, because cellulose is everywhere. It's 1.5 trillion tons annually. So this is just some of the fungi that do that. You've seen these growing on logs. That's what they're doing. Spores are not unique. Uh, everything has spores in a way, depending on how you look at the seeds and, 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 and the micro, mitospores uh, that are in plants. But ferns are all spore bearing, and so this is sort of the original, you know, germination method. So spores are uh, unique are unique to fungi in the sense that they are they define the fungus. And just to give you an example, this is this those are the spores from this thing, which is called the Argus conch, and it produces uh, billions of these spores uh, because they they'll be everywhere. Um, so the importance extends beyond what they are. Uh, and I won't go, in other talks, I go into great detail on some of these, but there are fungal diseases. You probably follow this uh, this um, black fungus thing that's, that's accompanying COVID in India. Uh, there are diseases out there. Uh, the chestnut blight, for example, you've probably heard of that. That's a tree in Shenandoah Park. Uh, LSD um, originally was discovered uh, within a, with a fungus from Ergo. Uh, then the whole yeast thing, and, and uh, then penicillin, of course. Those are all fungi. But you know some of that, but really I want to talk about this issue of mycorrhiza. 90% of all plants have mycorrhiza. In other words, they share their nutrients with fungi in their roots because fungi are 
heterotrophic. They need to get food from somewhere. They get it from trees. And this is what most of our mushrooms are doing, other than the decomposers, which are on dead logs. So uh, many, uh, most trees are obligate. In fact, all pine trees have to have mycorrhizae. You probably, if you've been listening to NPR and Susan Smart, who is this, uh, wrote the book, uh, Looking for the Mother Tree, is all about this story. Uh, about how connected the forest is, and this is something's been. Hey, well, uh, William. Yep. Sorry, it's Bronwyn again breaking in. We're still having problems with the audio. Um, we had Owen suggested that you pop off and come back on because it could be a um, audio initialization issue. Uh, I've tried that once before. I will try it again. So I'm going to have to stop here to get out of this. And I apologize, and we'll let you back in, and we'll try it again. All right, so no, but this sounds, this sounds better. Okay, so this is what, uh, if you look at the plant at the top, which is called the photobiont, these are the roots, and these are the fungal part of the roots, or the mycorrhizas, and so you can see it connects, it extends the root system, and connects to other root systems through the fungal hey, well, you Sorry, sorry, Ron went again. Just start the slideshow because it's it's still in your um uh, oh I'm sorry. Place. Yeah, thank you. I yeah. didn't to do that. You're right. Okay. Okay. There so we go. This is the story I was talking about. This is uh, Dr. Suzanne Samard. Uh, this is the whole thing you've heard of the wood wide web. You may have heard of the Hidden Life of Trees that came out about 10 years ago. Uh, and this is the most recent. So it's, this is just the whole idea that the forest is really a living, breathing thing and the fungi are an important part of it. So that's sort of why they're important. And you may not realize what's going on. Most people think of the mushroom as the fungus. It isn't. The fungus is underground. And these are the things called hypha, which are the root-like structures that go through the soil. And they, they, there's a whole thing of how they get together and form the underground mass, which is called the mycelium. And that's what's really the fungus. And as you can see from this picture, that as, it, as it extends up, the, the mushroom actually grows underneath the soil and produces the mushroom when it's ready to, to fruit. And so here's a, I dug this up, this is a colibia. You can see into the wood, I dug this wood out, and here's the wood, you can see the fungi going down into the wood. Uh, so that's really, the, the mycelium is really the fungus. So when you're picking the mushroom, it doesn't really have any effect, particularly on the mycelium. Uh, and this mycelium can get huge. You may have heard of the humongous fungus. Uh, this is a, a, it's actually what's called fox virus. It's an example of, of the most extensive root system of the honey mushroom. Uh, so this is just what the life cycle of mushrooms look like. So here's the spores, they germinate, they form the mycelium. The mycelium forms a primordium as it gets older and needs to reproduce. It forms a fruiting body to do the spore. So there's the cycle. So that's how it works. And uh, other features you should be aware of. Uh, when you're talking about mushrooms now only, every mushroom has a cap or pileus. Uh, they all have either on the bottom the gills or the pores where the spores come out. They have a stem or a stipe, which is the name of the, of the stalk. Some of them have this ring, which is important for the edible, non edible story. Some of them have a sac at the bottom called a vulva. And so these are important uh, aspects of some features that you might want to know about the edible and inedible edible things. So that's the end of the fungus input. I'm going faster, obviously, because we lost some time with my going on and off. But here are the takeaways. So mushrooms are the fruiting body of the fungi. They're not the fungus. Uh, they appear overnight because they're already there, mostly in August. So they're not quite up yet. Some are. Uh, and they are a kingdom. So on to edible and not it. So I always like to start with cautionary notes um, because uh, this is not a recipe for how to go out and find fine mushrooms. It is rather a, uh, a, a lead into uh, your understanding of the complexities of it. So there are about 6 million, uh, we think, species of fungi, of which 150,000 roughly are named, or so that we know, and only a few are deadly. But some of those deadly fungi are common, uh, there are 20 that are considered good edibles. I would say they're well known about, roughly. There's no simple way to distinguish the two. Um, you should only ever eat a mushroom if you're absolutely sure what it is. Uh, you'll like, likely, if you're doing a wild mushroom, you'll probably need an expert, at least for a while. 
Don't accept the testimony of somebody who thinks they know what they're talking about. Uh, number eight is actually pretty important. You should always taste it a few times before you eat it. Uh, and then you should only eat a little bit the first time because some things get different reactions to different people. Don't mix specimens. And if you're still interested and in, want to learn more, I'll have a slide at the end about the Mycological Association of Washington, D.C., uh, if you're interested in joining that. Here are the 12, I guess, dirty dozen, if you will, or uh, that are the most commonly known. I'll talk about each of these uh, to more or less extent so you're familiar with kind of the world of uh, what's out there. From the white button mushroom, which you, I'm sure, know, it's the one in your supermarket. Uh, also, the meadow mushroom is its cousin, which we'll talk about, and then the call down to the cauliflower mushroom, which you may or may not be familiar with. Most of the rest of these, some of you may be, but they're pretty common, and these are called the scientific names. So, first of all, let's talk about eating fungi in general. This is about, remember, this is about why you would want to do this, not necessarily how to go find it. So, why do portobello mushroom hamburgers sort of taste like hamburger? Well, it's because fungi are not made out of cellulose. They use it, but they're made out of chitin, which is that's the same uh, structure of the, you remember this perhaps from uh, bugs and beetles and or cicadas, of course. That's all chitin, that hard stuff and crap. That's a, a, a the reason why mushrooms have that sort of texture of, um, of meat when you bite down it is because of the chitin structure. It's got this uh, group that connects the two, so it, it gives it that toughness. Um, other than that, it's pretty close to cellulose. So that's what fungi are made out of. Uh, chitin has been subject of numerous studies. Uh, it, it generally uh, combines with lipids and bile and tends to clean out your system, at least from a physiological standpoint. There have been some studies, um, somewhat controversial. If you go on the web, you'll find different versions, but for the most part, it's not bad for you. The only question is how good is it? Uh, it's, a one, it's a very good fiber source. But more importantly, the thing that people probably don't realize is how much fungi are protein. Uh, 3.5 to 4% by wet weight, uh, by dry weight, up to 35%, and there are some comparative numbers there, uh, and just below meat. So I've been a vegetarian for about 30 years now, and so this is one of the reasons why I uh, have been eating mushrooms for quite some time, because it is a very good replacement protein. And as we'll discuss a little bit further, it's also a, kind of a better way to get protein. So here is... Uh, five different mushrooms. I labeled this one. I, I, in these slides, you'll see just the scientific name. That's, that's the name for the mushroom that we know as the white button mushroom, Agaricus bisporus. Uh, auricularia is a tree ear. This is a Boletus algulus or the sap. You may have heard of that. This is the, this is the oyster mushroom, and that's the shiitake. But you can see other than the tree ear, they're all pretty high in protein compared to this out of 100 grams. But more importantly, I think most people now are aware after DNA has been figured out how this whole thing works, right? It's all about amino acids and there are only 20 of them, of which eight are considered essential. And out of that, your body makes all the proteins. That's what RNA does, right? It takes amino acids and builds proteins out. So mushrooms have all eight. So here again are three of our, at least the ones that have been tested. This is not universal. Uh, again, this is the white button, the uh, shiitake and the oyster mushroom. And so these are the eight uh, amino acids. So why am I talking about Because amino acids are important. If you don't have all of them, then you're not really getting a full. So there's a thing called a nutrition index that kind of relates both the protein and the amino acid uh, relevancy or uh, essential amino acid index, it's called. So here is a, a breakdown of the different types of foods. Um, and you can see that under nutritional index, just below uh, meat and soybeans, you'll find mushrooms. And in addition to that, they're very high in, uh, in a number of different vitamins, in particular B vitamins, which are pretty important. And you can see some of the other minerals that are there. Uh, a medium-sized portobello has more potassium than a banana. So, so the question is, why eat fungi? Well, why not? Uh, they're quite good. And if, aside from the gustatory side, uh, the Epicurean, the, the Gourmet, it's more about your health in addition to that. And they're low calorie. So let's, that's it for why we're going to do this. So let's look now at some of the edible types and about some of the non-edible types that are their partners in crime. 
So I mentioned the two phyla. There are two big ones. There are four actually, but Astomycota is the largest of the two phyla. And this is where you find all your yeast to kind of sell in, uh, aspirin, all the moles, and almost no mushrooms, except for one, the morel, as the only edible mushroom that's in Astomycete. There are others, but not many. They tend to have strange names and they have strange appearances. So here's the orange earth tongue. If you wander around the forest enough, you find these things, they are out there. Uh, and I, I, I usually don't know, that's a scientific name, it's immaterial here. This one's called Dead Man's Fingers, uh, which is a kind of an interesting uh, name, obviously by appearance that would come to mind. So these are the famous morels. Uh, they're cup fungi, they're called, asco means cup. So the spore surface is actually the outside of, and these are like little cups here. And it's a bunch of little cups that surround uh, and they're kind of welded together, if you will. Uh, and here they are cooking. Uh, I do, as I said, cooking is not my specialty. I use uh, olive oil, uh, extra virgin, usually not, because that matters that much. Uh, and just saute, I'm sure butter is fine, and saute them in anything. So there are two types of which there are now many varieties. And DNA has wreaked havoc with the fungal world uh, because now that we know DNA, we know what species are and are not. So things that look alike aren't necessarily um, the same as they look. They have different species. We're discovering that. I, if you look in the upper left, I hunted for morels in this area for 20 years. And that's the most I ever found in a day up until this year. And this year I happened to hit uh, what I cannot believe ever happened, but here's, this is some of them put down. There were more than 90 all around one tree. Uh, and this is a picture, this is up in Shenandoah Park, and you, you can't see it very well, but they're just everywhere. Uh, because the mycelium was struggling to uh, get its spores out. They were past the point where most of the spores had gone, so here's what we gathered that day. So it, it does happen, it took me 20 years. So like many, you should never eat a raw mushroom, even button mushrooms, although they serve them as salad bars. Um, we'll talk about that next. But morels are toxic when they're raw. They will make you sick. We'll talk about the types of toxins uh, that are of an issue where there's, there's seven different uh, categories of toxins. So uh, here they are cooked, that same group you saw the first time. So. People love to go out and hunt for these things. And I said, they're very hard to find. They're, they disguise themselves. And may, very often you see things like this that look a lot like a morel, right? White stem, kind of brown top with these sort of same type. Well, that's a doppelganger, a, a evil twin, if you will. It's called the brain mushroom. There are several types, gyromitra. It's also called the false morel. And here is one in the field that doesn't look quite so much. Here's one that does look more like a morel. Uh, and they produce gyromitrin, which is a chemical, has the chemical monomethyl hydrazine, which is a uh, used in rocket fuel and therefore not particularly good for you. Uh, they can result in a nausea and in some cases death. Although some people do eat them mostly over in Europe. I don't advise playing Russian roulette with your, uh, edible mushrooms, but be careful whenever you think you have a morel because these are out there. Now, uh, this is the only other aspect of my seeds if we're talking food. Truffles are fungi. Now, they don't even come out of the ground. And you probably, and they're, they're probably the most well-known of the uh, gourmet fungi. Uh, they cost about $395 uh, for seven ounces. That's the last time I looked this up. So they're, why, are they, why are they so pungent? Because their way of spreading their spores is to attract digging animals like pigs or dogs, but other ground animals to find them, eat them, and then the spores exit through their alimentary canal into their uh, feces, and that's how the spores spread. So that's how truffles work. So the whole goal is to spread your spores. So this is, now we're gonna to go to the phylum Bicidio microtum, which is the 
called it's a club a club my uh, club this the studio is a club it's just it's the way the spores are mounted is all that really matters and in this case they're either gills or pores that's the meadow mushroom uh it's got pink gills when it's fresh this is the same one basically you get in the store because it was from this mushroom that was the the, the button mushroom was first uh developed in france uh they sometimes form fairy rings uh, and there are fairy ring mushrooms, and you've heard of fairy rings, no doubt. And now I think you probably know why there's fairy rings, because the mycelium is in the center. And these fruiting bodies are moving outward away from the center because they're trying to send the spores outward. So this is a plate with white mushrooms, creminis, and portobellos. They're all the same mushroom. They're all agaricus spores, and they're all grown together. As I mentioned, they were first cultivated in the 18th century. It's a really interesting story about the French caves in Paris and the King of France, Louis XIV, who loved these things. The mushrooms were growing and an entrepreneurial, um, uh, I think it was the king's cook who figured out how to grow it inside the caves. That's how this whole thing with mushrooms growing in caves started, which is for real. That's how it started in France in the 19th century. So this is probably the mushroom that started people eating in the first place, this meadow mushroom. And also connects the idea of deadly mushrooms to edible mushrooms. Uh, and that's a BC cartoon. As near as I can determine, he was making some sort of a mushroom chart. So if somebody back in time, you know, people figured out what you could and couldn't eat by trying them. Foods are the same way, by the way. But mushrooms are kind of probably more notorious for being potentially deadly. So this one, the deadly doppelganger of this one is called the Destroying Angel. And it's the most important one you should learn because it's very similar in appearance to the meadow mushroom. Grows in similar areas on the ground. Very common. I, I find more of these than I find meadow mushrooms. Um, it's alabaster flesh has wiped out whole families. Uh, and this is the one you hear about that destroys your liver. Uh, it's, there are several versions of this, but this is the one that's most common. And this is why I was pointing out earlier in my going in and out of my ability to talk to you was this is the vulva, the cup at the bottom. This is the ring or annulus around the stem. And there's also a cap that has partial spots. What this is, this is a veil that covers the gills. And when this comes out of the ground, this is connected to here. So it protects all of the spores until it's out of the ground. That's what it's for. And that's why amanitas are so successful. Uh, and that's why they have this cup um, to, to protect the spores until it's out of the ground. So other than that, this is all white. As I said, the meadow mushroom has pink gills uh, and doesn't have this cup at the bottom. So this is the worst of the poisons. Um, this is the one that kills you in about a week by destroying your liver. Uh, you probably it, this makes the papers now and then rarely now because it's pretty much more well known than it was. Uh, there's about four people that die per year, roughly, based on the databases that, that we track at the Mycological Association. Um, if they have some treatments for it, and in the worst case, there's a liver transplant that is that's necessary. So the third of our um, most notable of animals is, of course, the chanterelle. That already came up tonight. This one is prolific. Uh, it also has an evil twin. This one is not deadly. Uh, it must make you sort of violently ill. This is the chanterelle. Chanterelle is a, a, a Latin word for cup, like goblet, because they grow, as you can sort of see, and this is a cup shape here with an irregular margin. Uh, and it's recognized worldwide. Um, I was hiking up in Finland many years ago, and I was ran across these three people walking through the woods, and they, they spoke Finnish, and we only spoke English, so, but they were carrying chanterelles, so we had this wonderful show and tell on the trail of these people, so it's everywhere. This was a, a bin in, in Helsinki, where they were selling chanterelles on the open market, and these are some of the names in different countries. Since why we don't use common names too much, in uh, Germany, it's the egg yolk mushroom, woman's dress in Spain, canary bird chicken, so these are all common name for the local uh, populations for these very common mushrooms. So the way you recognize these is they don't have gills, they have ridges. These, these are not the edge 
very fine edges that you see on the bottom of gill mushrooms. Uh, this last year was a banner year. I, I found these all in one outing up in uh, Massanutten Mountain. Um, and these are them, of course, cooking, uh, again, the same technique. They're yellow-orange, they grow on the ground, and their counterpart in the non-edible world are called jack-o'-lanterns. So here are the jack-o'-lantern mushrooms, and you can see they're about the same color, sort of the same shape. But jack-o'-lanterns have gills. They don't have ridges. They grow on wood at the base of trees. They don't grow on the ground. Typically in groups, these grow mostly individually in clusters. So there's lots of differences. Jack-o'-lanterns will make you sick. And that gets us to the issue of toxins. So we've talked about a couple of them, gyromycin, amatoxin, and now this thing about jack-o'-lanterns that makes you ill. Now notice that I say that it can be medicinal with lower doses, because a toxin, and the, the definition of antibiosis is that any association is harmful to one of them. So fungi and bacteria are, are in a global struggle for survival you know, in the sub rosa world uh, that we can only know by study and cannot really see. So fungi have developed a lot of ways to fight off bacteria. That's what penicillin is doing. So we can use fungi in the same way, but obviously if you get too much, then it's going to overwhelm your own system and we have our own healthy bacteria. So here are the toxins. And you can see there's 10 groups. Uh, we've talked about the amanita. So that's the amatoxin, and they're called cyclopeptides. Here's the gyromycin, which are the false morels. Uh, these are in some other types, which I won't go into the inky caps. Um, this is the uh, Amanita muscaria, and this is the fly garrick. We'll, we'll touch on that somewhat later. Psilocybin is considered a toxin. That's the magic mushroom, the one that's in psilocybin mushrooms, the LSD component. Uh, and then this group seven is really what most of the stuff you're going to ever, if you happen to, to get a bad mushroom, it'll cause gastrointestinal distress. And that's where the jack o' lantern fits in. And there are a couple other types that are, you know, a couple different uh, types of just uh, universe, you know, singular mushrooms that have, that we know of. But there are 10 different identified toxins. So don't think there's just one. So the one you're most likely to run into would be this, this group seven. So basically what the clinical recommendation is that it, it occurs 30 minutes to three hours, and here are some of the symptoms that you're familiar with them. Now you may want to ask yourself, why does this happen? You're, you know, you're, I'm not sure if you thought about this much, but why do, you, why do you have nausea? It's because your stomach is protecting you. It, it senses something that it doesn't like. I mean, you don't know, it tasted fine. And by the way, if it was bitter, it probably is trying to tell you that it was toxic. It gets in your stomach and your stomach decides, well, uh, this does not belong here and then throws it up. If it gets into your small intestine and into your large intestine, then of course you're also protected there with diarrhea and sometimes both. So that's what's going to happen if you get this stuff in you. And in most cases, it's just, it'll go away. You won't like it, of course, but you'll get over it. Which raises the question of, again, why would you not, so the two things I've talked about so far are the goodness of eating fungi and then some of the dangers of the wild fungi. So I'm just going to talk briefly about some, you may not be aware of how many cultivated, this is a growing, there are many, many types of cultivated fungi that are emulating some of the wild types um, that are quite good. Poisoning here is not a concern. Uh, they, they grow on compost. They're growing on waste anyway. Uh, so the way you do this is you get spawn. You basically encourage a, a mycelium. So people do this. You can do it yourself. Uh, I give a talk on this. Uh, but this is just the mycelium. As we call it spawn. And you may have heard of this. And you just you grow it in agar or petri dish. And then you put it in bags with grain and you grow the mycelium and then you put the bags out and then the mushrooms come out the side. You can also do this with logs. I was involved in a project, that's what these pictures are from. So there's three different types of doing this. Uh, shiitakes use either logs or bags. Uh, the button mushrooms, the ones that are up in, um, in mostly Pennsylvania, use uh, 
the tray or bed culture, again, growing on compost for the most part. And then the stuff in the soil are called tertiary. Those are the kind we don't eat. So if you've never been up to um, Tenet Square, that's the mushroom capital of the world, you may want to, if you're interested in mushrooms, it's worth a trip. They have a mushroom museum up there. I, I, we get some mushrooms for our club up there. This is the way I took some pictures. That's how it's quite an industrial operation. Uh, here, these are the, the oyster mushrooms they're throwing out, by the way. Uh, so it's quite a, uh, and this is a truck where they're falling them away. Um, these are just, this is, they're growing a crabini in Portobello just to reaffirm my statement that those are just uh, a garage of this forest. Um, and shiitake, uh, they've been growing those in China for uh, about uh, a couple of millennia or one year or two. Uh, and then log inoculation. Uh, so these are really uh, the world's most popular global. And, and here's the log cultivation. Again, you're trying to get the mycelium to grow in the log. Um, and this was developed in uh, Japan and China. So world mushroom production is actually mushroom, if you want to use that uh, analogy. So uh, from 1978 to today, it went from 1 billion to 3 billion, uh, and that is kilograms. So there's 2.2 uh, kilograms in a pound, so that's half that if you want pounds. Um, so the population is not quite doubled, so obviously people are eating a lot more mushrooms. And here are the, the major types that are grown. So this is the shiitake over here. Here's the oyster. Here's our button mushroom. Uh, I'm sorry, here's our button mushroom. This is the tree ear. Uh, these are two other types that I won't get into uh, that you can get. Um, China produces most of these. And Asia, people have been eating much, uh, uh, fungi in Asia for much longer than we've been trying them here. Uh, and you'll notice that uh, cultivated is only 54% of the total industry. Medicinal is almost half that. So here's just to give you an idea of shiitake production globally, uh, just showing that in the blue is China and the red, I think, is the North America. That's because they went to the bag uh, culture. And this is the wood ear. So I said I touch on medicinals only because I just brought up the fact that almost half of them are medicinals. So what we do know about medicinals is somewhat and it goes, but it's mostly polypores. And I haven't talked about polypores yet, so I'm going to talk about two more very readily identifiable fungi that are uh, notable and fairly easy to find. So a polypore literally means many pores. Uh, you see them, and they're, again, they grow on dead things mostly, or, or some are uh, mycorrhizal. but mostly they are saprophytes. Um, and they, the pores are where the spores come out. You've probably heard of hen of the woods, and you've probably heard of chicken of the woods. So here is what a hen of the woods looks like. It's called a hen of the woods because it sort of looks like a hen. And they are very, this is probably my favorite fungus to eat. Um, they're named Grifola frondosa. Uh, griffin is what this animal is up here, or I should say symbol. It's a, a made up animal with a body of a lion, or I'm uh, sorry, body of a, of a, yeah, I guess it's a lion. It's kind of a lion and body of a, of a eagle. Uh, again, the king of the air and king of the forest, that's the idea. Because it, 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 the French call it de griffon because the, the, this looks like a like a griffin's legs to them. But to us, we call it in the woods. But same as Trifola frondosa. This is what they look like in the fields. So they're not quite as pristine as the one I showed you. They, but they're, they're pretty obvious. This has been used in Asian medicine for centuries. Uh, and it's, it's recently been... Uh, proven in various uh, actual official science trials, Sloan Kettering Center for Treatment of AIDS, and various other. This is one of many, by the way. I, I'm only pointing this out to it's a well known animal. And I threw in chicken in the woods here, which is not a medicinal, but because people confuse chicken with hen, uh, it's not, so it's obviously not called chicken because it looks like a chicken, whereas hen is called hen because it looks like a hen. Uh, but you can't mistake this one. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it did get, be, get to be huge, uh, up to 100 pounds, and you can get a whole meal uh, for, for weeks, uh, and these things don't shrink down much when you cook them. So here they are cooking. So why is it called chicken? Remember what I said about chitin? This thing actually tastes like chicken, and um, has a texture of chicken. If you put it in a casserole after you cook it and cut it up like chicken breast, most people, unless you tell, they won't know the difference. So that's why it's called chicken in the woods. So what, how we know about medicinal mushrooms, you probably have heard of, let's see, the Iceman. He was found in a glacier up in Switzerland. Here is what he looked like when he was found. 
they figured out what he apparently looked like from what they found with him. And he had these two birch bark baskets. And in those baskets, he had two types of fungi, fungi this thing called tater fungus, which is used as a fire starter or fire maintainer. It's additionally a medicinal, but more importantly, they found this, this called a birch polypore, tryptopore spatulitis, which is a medicinal because it gets the uh, betulin, which is the chemical that it has from the birch, which the birch produces to protect itself from worms and other things that want to eat the birch, which is why it gets that from the fungi. So Bootsy knew somehow through the lore of the time that this was a good way to treat whipworm, or at least that's what they found in his system. And we can always surmise that's why he was carrying it with him. So people have been using fungi for medicinals for many years uh, in Asia. That's why 38% of the global production is for that. I won't go into any more detail. There's a lot more turkey tail. I could go on for another hour just on that, but we're talking about edible and non-edible. So we're going to, um, I went through that pretty fast or I was trying to get back on track. We're now gonna talk about edible versus non-edible as some of the major families that are just kind of round out your knowledge of the other edible fungi that we talked about. Jelly, fungi, coral fungi. These are families, by the way. Tooth fungi, which have teeth instead of pores or gills. And then we've already talked about sort of some of the agarics, uh, so these are the agaricus species, like the button mushroom, the amanitas. Notice, and the red means poison, the green means edible. So you notice this one is split up because some are, some aren't. Uh, and then oyster mushrooms, and final orders is pumpkin. So jelly fungi are, as they are, sound they're gelatinous. Uh, you may have seen these; they're very common. This is the tree ear. Uh, auricularia auricula basically means ear ear in uh, both the genus and species are named that way. They're not that high in the nutrition category. You may have noticed as I went through my chart, I, I did point out they're pretty low on protein. They're basically blob grains. They're, they're like jelly. They're very viscous. You, you've probably seen this one. It's called witch's butter. Uh, it's edible. You, I noticed I've also used the label colors here. So if it's, if it's a greenish bluish, it's edible. And this is these are better with you mix them with things. These are with fried potatoes. So they give a, a good texture to things like potatoes. Um, this is the only mixed, mixed message you'll get from me. Well, actually, the last one you will too. I have one recipe I will share with you. I said I wouldn't, but I will. Coral fungi are beautiful. They're mostly edible. I don't know of any that are poisonous, but they're usually not worth bothering with because they, uh, so they're beautiful. They're different colors. There's purple ones. I, I've, you're probably seeing these. If you just look on logs, you'll find them sometimes in great profusion. Uh, there is one well-known edible. This is the cauliflower mushroom. It was the last one on my list. Sporacis raticata. Uh, hard to, you know, confuse. Oh, I have this other picture. This is typically what you see. Here's the log. And you can see them growing up. This is much, looks like a cauliflower. Uh, it's hard to miss. And again, it's pretty easy to identify. There are no, nothing that looks like this that you can confuse. So it's pretty safe to, to, to pick up. Tooth fungi, as I mentioned, um, and I haven't talked about all the different ways that fungi produce spores. I mentioned truffles, there's stinkhorns, there's inky caps, there's different ways that mushrooms and teeth are like teeth, right? They're hanging down. And the spore surface is the outside of the tooth. So again, you're trying to maximize the spore surface. That's what gills are doing as well. And pores, the spores come up, up and down the pores and they come out from the gills. So you have gills to maximize the surface area. Otherwise, you just have a flat surface because you want to produce as many spores as you can. Teeth do the same thing. So this is the notorious satyr's beard, bearded hedgehog. Got lots of different names. Uh, these are more a late autumn to winter mushroom fungus, I should say. Uh, they're kind of acidic tasting, but they're not bad. And here again, these are cooking. Um, again, none poisonous. This is a hard one to mistake from anything else. So you see this, you'll know what you're looking at. They, they can get quite large. So here we get into some of the more questionable ones. You can notice your, here's your first uh, pinkish. So this is the agaricus species. And uh, this is the agaricus campestris. You'll notice the pink gills. You can sort of see them here, pinkish. 
Uh, there's also a Lepiota, which is edible, and you can see it's got very similar. It's got the ring, but unfortunately, there are quite a few of these out there, and Amanitas are not a, even agarics. This is called the uh, Chlorophyllum molybdides, which is called the green spore, spore Lepiota. You can see these are kind of green. So every year, you'll read about people that go out into their commons area in their in their in their housing complex. These grow in grassy areas. Typically in mulch and things like that, they're pretty common. You get out of your car and, and you'll you'll see them right there. And people, oh, what a beautiful mushroom! They they're definitely type seven toxins. You, you'll end up in the emergency room, uh, probably. So that's one to be very wary of. Uh, wary of. We've talked about amanitas, uh, and there of course are they're all pink. There are a few of these that are edible. I wouldn't recommend trying any of them. You'll notice these little spots. So I remember I talked about the universal veil, the thing that comes up from the bottom and then also into the partial veil. These are the fragments of the veil that are on the cap. And they're very typically on all of these. You can see that it's a good way to identify a, an Amanita because it has veil fragments on it. That's called the panther cap. This is called yellow patches. They're all Amanitas. So the one notorious one I mentioned, which I'll only digress slightly, on is this uh, uh, Amanita muscaria or the fly garret, only because this is the most known visible mushroom of all time, um, because it's a beautiful mushroom. I took this picture in Finland. Ours are not that red. Uh, we have one called a variation Formosa, which is yellowish and doesn't have that much. Uh, it, and it's got this uh, ibotonic acid in it, which causes something like a, a not a psychedelic type, not like the psilocybin mushrooms, more of a of a of a trance-like state. So there's lots of theories about what this, and these are Nordic. So one of the theories is this is where Santa Claus, the idea of the shaman came from. This, uh, these are all theories. There's no way to prove any of this, but it's it's got a lot of historical relevance to it. So you should know that it's got a lot more stories than just being a pretty mushroom. So the last uh, thing I'm going to talk about is uh, not a family but an order, and these are the puffballs. They range in size from these uh, pear-shaped puffballs, is one name of them, or gem-studded puffballs, uh, up to the size of a soccer ball. This is the giant puffball. Uh, they are almost all edible. You notice I've got the, the bluish-green colors here with some. Uh, the red is this one, only because it's not really a puffball. It's not a lipoperdin or a calvation or the two genera. It, but it looks like a puffball. So if you cut it open and you see it's black inside, you'll see that it's definitely not a puffball. It's called a pigskin poison puffball. But other than that, if you cut one of these open and it's white inside, because what happens, this is called a gleba, the center part, and it, it is actually the spores, but they, they, they get when they get old, they turn dark. So as long as it's white, they're, they're quite good. Uh, the reason they're called puffballs is because once they get mature, this little hole called an operculum opens at the top, and the raindrops come down and hit the sides of the, of the ball and then puff the spores out the top, which is why it's called puffball. Uh, and if you ever want to learn a genus name, the genus name is Lycoperdon. So if you know any Latin, Lyco means wolf, and Perdon means passing wind. So the other common name is, you know, wolves passing wind is what other people might refer to this as. That's what we call them puffballs to try and be, I guess, polite about. So I sent out about one recipe. So here is, if you cut these things, these things in like, like bread, and then you dip them in batter, and then you fry them, they're sort of like French puffball toast. Uh, and they, they're just, they're excellent. And, and even after you freeze them and recook them, they, they last quite a long time. This will make quite a few. So that's the Galvatia gigantica, the giant puff. So just to roll, to finish out the, the other types that you're familiar with, here's the oyster mushrooms. You can buy these in the store. This is what they look like in the field. Uh, again, this is a very large family, the Tagloma. Uh, you, the honey mushroom I mentioned earlier, it is edible. That, that one's orange. Uh, the caution there is must be well cooked uh, because like the morel, they can be uh, even slightly cooked, they need to be well cooked. Um, so this is what they look like in the field, growing uh, like an eyebrow almost. Uh, it, it's, it, in fact, the name uh, Pleurotus uh, means ear. So it grows like an ear. Uh, the bolis 
are a type of just a kind of name for a group of mushrooms, and they've all been broken down to different genera now. But they have pores instead of gills. Uh, this is probably the world's most famous uh, edible mushroom, the chamboli, the sep. Uh, we have them here, but they're not easy to find. These things range all the sizes and the shapes. Here's the old man of the woods, which is edible. And here is the Boeus bipolar. It's got red cap and yellow pores. And you'll notice I have this orange because we have a, uh, boletes are mostly edible. And in, in the Mycological Association, one of our rules is you can eat a bolete as long as it does not have a red pore surface. So the pore surface here is yellow, not red. It's not bitter if you taste it. And if it's not bitter, remember bitter tells you it's poison because there are some bitter ones of these that are not edible and they're somewhat toxic. And if it stains blue, now, that's why I have this orange, because this one is actually edible, but there is one, that, and this is what staining blue means. You push your thumb on it, and it turns blue. Uh, there's a phenomenon that, that some mushrooms, uh, that occurs because of the chemistry of them, and there is one that causes um, um, nausea. So you stay away from any of them that stay blue, unless you know what they are. So wrapping up now with a little bit one more than one minute over, but we lost some of that. Uh, you know, we're not the only things that eat fungi. I took this picture on my back porch. This is a squirrel eating a uh, Russell stem. Um, these are, this is slug uh, eating the underside of a, uh, I'm not sure what type of mushroom that is, but slugs are, um, and this is called a fungus beetle. Uh, you can't see them here very well. They're all over these mushroom, uh, oyster mushrooms. They, they live on them. And they're global. Uh, people hunt these all over the world. I was up in, uh, in the, uh, the Pyrenees. Uh, we were climbing up into a mountain in Andorra. I, I bent down to look at this on the ground. We saw these people off in the woods and beside us, and they kept going ahead of us and behind us. And as I was looking down, this guy came up behind me. I heard them, and he said, Pazaiza. So we call this brown earth guy. I don't know what they, 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 and they, were, they were hunting. As it turns out, we met, we met as I talked about the fins, and he showed me what they were doing. They were hunting. These are king bolites or accepts, uh, and they're very common. And it is the most well-known mushroom in Europe. He, he only spoke Catalan, and we only spoke English. So we had a, a nice conversation about mushrooms, mostly with pointing again and gesticulation. So that brings us to the close. Um, so fungi are a key part of uh, nature's world. Uh, that's what I talked about in the beginning. So it's not just about the mushroom. So where do we go? I mean, the world is kind of suffering ecologically. I think we would probably all agree with that. There's, we're, there's things we could all do. Uh, you may have heard of corn. This is a micro protein. Uh, it's, it's actually all, it's all fungus. Uh, it's made in Great Britain. Uh, I, I, I just, I eat it. It's, 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 it's pretty good. You might try it. Uh, this is a U-Haul truck with a the humongous fungus on it. So th the point is that fungi are getting much more well known. This is from Whole Foods. Um, and you, if you see it there, this is a uh, spicy chicken and fungi. So, you know, so it's really become mainstream. This is a plant and that's a, a PLNT. So, so I, I'm encouraging everyone to eat fungi uh, and, and at least try and to go out and, and find those that you can, but be cautious with that. So if you are interested in more information about mycology, uh, this is the MAUDC. This is from our website, uh, and it's pretty self-explanatory. I won't go into it. That's our website address. Just think MAUDC. So my references for this um, book-wise, uh, The Fifth Kingdom is a very good book if you're interested uh, by Bryce King Kendrick. It's more of a kind of quasi-scientific, but pretty good. Uh, for field guides, I use the Gary Linkoff's Audubon Field Guide, and this is the best one, I think, just to get started for our area, uh, Mushrooms of West Virginia and Central Appalachia. Uh, this is a good website for looking, just looking things up that uh, got a lot of stuff on. This is my website, the Hyper's Notebook that has, in addition to fungi, a bunch of other things. You might want to look at that uh, for some, mostly kind of ethnobotany. So with that, uh, that is the end. We've covered most of these. I mentioned there were other things out there. Uh, lichens are mostly fungi. Uh, I didn't talk about this. It's called rock tripe, which is also edible. It's a survival food. This is the uh, slime mold. 
which is not a fungus at all. It's part of the Protista kingdom, which they probably have renamed now. And lots, and you've seen some of these in the picture. So with that, I am concluding tonight's talk, sort of on time. I do apologize for all the, I hope the rest of it, since nobody stopped me again, I'm, I'm assuming you could hear me the rest of the way through. And Ron, I'll turn it over to you if you want to do any questions or not. It's uh, it's up to you. I can I can stick around for a little bit and answer a few. And I can go ahead and stop sharing at any time now. Yep, let's stop share, William. That was wonderful. We'll come back together and we'll see if there's any um, questions. Um, and if you are not muted, uh, please mute yourself. Uh, let's see. Brad wanted to know, was Emperor Claudius killed with Amanita? Do you know that? Um, oh, yeah, that's an interesting story. Uh, it's, I, I, I wrote up the full story under, if you look on my website under Amanita, the full story is there. If you type in Hyper's Notebook Amanita, it'll, it'll take you there. But, and I watched I, Claudius, and I was curious about that. And, um, and of course, the story is, 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 is I think it's his, um, actually his grandmother. Uh, and he, so, I, I, there's a whole bunch of sources. He definitely died of something that was food poisoning. I, I don't know that I agree that it was a mushroom because typically mushroom poisonings don't, not deadly ones. They, they're much slower. And that according to all the records, he was he almost immediately died. Now, it could have been a toxic mushroom and he was weakened and he had a compromised system and maybe he had a heart attack. I, I can't say. But it clearly, what type of mushroom will remain forever unknown, I think, or just a matter of lore and not fact. All right. Any other questions? Um, do you lead any field trips in the area? Nancy wants to know. So, uh, the Mike, yes and no. Uh, the Mycological Association of Washington, we host forays. We call them forays. Those are mushroom walks. Why the name was chosen, I don't know. Forays, what you do is a military enterprise, so, you know, so seeking out, you've heard of military for you, that's what we call them. We host them, uh, and we did the Morel forays through the spring. We'll start up again here in July. Um, you, for the moment, because of the COVID problems, we've been restricting it to members only. Um, but as things unwind, we'll probably open up to all people. And if you want to join Ma, I mean, you, you, you can go to our meetings and you can go on forays, and we have other events. Uh, it's, I think it's $25, $20 a, month, a year per person. So that's, if you're really interested in doing that, that's the best way. I do, like I'm, I'm, I'm involved with a group up in North Baltimore. I'm, I'm teaching a mushroom class Tuesday for them and I'm taking them on a short walk. I thought about maybe doing something through the Natural uh, Historical Society. I, I don't know, I'm, I, some sort of problem. I might, I might offer that at some point out of Brownman's organization here. I, I've considered that, and maybe that's my next step, but I haven't done that yet. We'd love to have you do a, t uh, a walk for us, William. Uh, let's see. Uh, Gilad wants to know do, do, where fallow toxins fit into the toxin groups you mentioned. Uh, what fallow toxin? P P H A L L O T O X I N S. Fallow toxin. I've heard of the, uh, I've heard of the uh, prefix, but um, I I I have to go, I don't think I was one of the ones that is on the the list, but I, it does sound familiar, probably a subset of one of the others that I, I mentioned. I can't remember what fallow means, it's like fal falmine poisoning, I think that, that that prefix means something specific in Latin, but I can't, I do not have any specifics about that particular type of toxin. And um, Kels wants to know the difference uh, between chanterelle gills and jack-o'-lantern gills again. Okay, so we, they're called ridges. So in other words, a, a gill is like a knife edge, and it's very narrow, uh, like a knife. Uh, so chanterelles are sort of like uh, come down, not they come more or less to a point, but they they they're they're gradual. You can see it, and you can see the bottom. You can see it's just like a slope, and some of them are very smooth, and they vary somewhat. So that's that's one of three things that I mentioned. You know, one is it's got ridges and not gills. Two is it grows on the ground singly. And three, it's got a, a, a more of a, a flask shape. 
uh, and a more wavy edge. Those are the three things that distinguish it. Chanterelles have gills, they grow on tree stumps, and they have more rounded margins. The only thing that's really common is the color. Um, Shireen was interested in what are the laws about collecting on public land? So, interesting question. And there's not a good answer because uh, my general rule is don't ask, don't tell. Uh, and it depends on where you go. One interesting anecdote is Shenandoah Park, in their park regulations, allow every person to collect one gallon of morels and one quart of edible mushrooms per day, per person, because that was an arrangement they made with the people when it became a park. Uh, National Forest is fine. The only place I know that specifically says no is Rockville Park and Greenbelt Park. Um, those are around Washington. Um, mostly if you're discreet, as I said, it does not hurt the mushroom. Mostly people don't know and don't care. And the most reaction I've ever gotten to people is if they see me do it, collecting, they'll say, don't eat that, it's poisonous. So I, I wouldn't worry about it. Just be discreet. Don't go wandering around the big group with a bunch of baskets and, and there's, there's not any particular problem. Let's see, any other questions coming up on the chat box? I don't see any. But there's a lot of thank yous, William, in the chat box. Well, I, and I, um, I agree. Well, thank you. Problems. well, it happens. And, uh, and the information people wanted to um, uh, have access maybe to some of the images on the slides. Um, I don't know how you feel about that. Um, I, I gave you my website. My, my email address is on my website. Uh, and it, it, it's, it's me at 82 at AOL.com. So if you just go to Hyper's Notebook and go to the front page at the very bottom, that's what my website is there. And if you want to send me an email with any questions you have or you have a specific picture you want, uh, that's fine. Uh, and I, you know, I just, you know, I, I do, I do communicate openly. I'm not afraid of sharing my, my, my email address is on my website. So I'm not discouraging this as long as you keep it within reason, obviously. That's, that's most of, I'm sure if you're on this talk, then I'm sure you're reasonable. Right. Well, that's wonderful. And um, it, thank you for making yourself available. Uh, so take advantage of William's generosity. Uh, go to his website. Which was what? What was the website again? It's hikersnotebook.net or .blog. You can just type in hikers notebook in Google, and once you get past the Amazon people selling hikers notebooks, literally, it's the next. It's the next. It should be the next one down. Okay, it's hikers notebook. Check it out, and you can contact William with any um, other questions about. Uh, Fungi. I hope that everybody enjoyed this. That so you all look smarter um, than when we started, so that's great. And I hope that we'll see you back here um, every Thursday. We can learn something new. Next, remember, next Thursday is the saw what saw wet owls, um, and we will uh, take care, stay safe, stay curious, stay outside. And eat some mushrooms. Um, take care, everybody. Good night. Good night, everybody.